Hello and welcome to MIT's Future of Work and Learning webinar, where we will be getting the experts to help you, to guide you on figuring it out, what it is that you need to do in order to um, get create a recession-proof career. <laughs> find out more about our MIT online learning space, um, and also uh, where's the future of work heading? So we've got with me today, I'll just go on to the next slide, the panel of experts. So my name is Shraddha Gurung. I'm the course advisor at MIT. I've got with me Professor Johnson Agvinia, who is the head of school, School of IT and Engineering. And we've also got Associate Professor Monica Duran, who is the course coordinator for undergraduate business programs. And finally, we've got Associate Professor Tony Jan, who is the course coordinator for undergraduate networking programs, as well as the Associate Head of School for School of IT and Engineering. Just to give you a quick overview of what we will be covering today, uh, we'll start off with a bit about the future of work, you know, which industries are hit hardest by job automation and how best to prepare for it. We've got recession-proof careers. Does it really exist? Uh, we'll find out from the experts. Um, online learning at MIT, which will be led by uh, Professor Monica. She will give you some detailed information on how it's all going so far. Um, this is gonna be, the July intake is gonna be our second semester where we're doing online learning. So how's that panning out and what can you expect if you're starting in the July intake? And, Second last, we've got how MIT supports you. So a bit more about the support services and how they all align you, uh, align together to provide you the skill set even to uh, for you to um, really thrive in the in the future of work. And the final one it will be about micro credentialing. So how it could be a great option for time for professionals. So a little bit about uh, the future of work. Now, we all know the world is changing as this pandemic has you know, shown us, uh, we are actually, it's actually pushed us to move a bit more rapidly into the future. And it's amazing, but also scary. So the current mo mo education model is, is based on the first and second industrial revolution, you know, when the mass production of uniform talent was used to feel repetitive, process oriented early like manufacturing jobs and stuff. Now, obviously this model does not work anymore. And because the world is changing, you've got automation, you've got machine learning, they're all taking over. And most of today's job didn't exist 10, 15 years ago, I can tell you that. Um, so this new changes industry is actually, it's coined as the fourth industrial revolution. And basically what we're also gonna talk about today, the future of learning is how education is needed for this new generation of workforce to, to really um, be competitive in this fourth industrial revolution. So we'll quickly talk about a little bit about the jobs that didn't exist about 10, 15 years ago. We've got a social media manager, like we've, I believe uh, Facebook came around 2006. And since then social media has taken off and you know, so has the jobs. So we've got chief listening officer. So it's sort of like a communications marketing role. Uh, you're basically listening uh, to all the communications that's coming in and out of a company. So, you know, we didn't obviously have this. Um, and we've got the SEO specialist, something that our digital marketing uh, major actually covers. A sustainability manager, our business degree does uh, cover ethics and sustainability as well. So if that's something that you want to go into, this, uh, you know, there is a job set for you as sustainability manager that has only just arrived in the last 10 to 15 years. We've got a personal brand manager, uh, user experience designer. So both of them, uh, marketing and digital marketing uh, units, uh, majors will cover. Now for IT technology related, uh, uh, what do you call that, careers, we've got the cloud computing specialist. Uh, we've got app developers and designers. We've got big data analysts and data miners. So really, really exciting stuff. Um, and these are, those four are definitely something that, you know, you can do. 
uh, from actually studying our course, getting a degree at MIT, either networking or engineering, this is something that you can actually go on to as a career. And we've also got obviously the virtual reality game developer. Even that is something you can do as well with an MIT degree and a drone operator. So all these stuffs not non-existent 10, 15 years ago. So you can actually imagine what will the next 10, 15 years bring? What do you think? I'll just put the question forward to the panelists. What do you think about uh, the jobs that's coming? Or do you know any other jobs that's, that you know, doesn't exist, didn't used to exist 10, 15 years ago? Um, look, looking at the list, uh, particularly on the right hand side, you could add a few more like mm -hmm. data curator. Mm -hmm. um, the world now is looking at data, 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 and we need people who are able to curate data. Mm -hmm. And the other one is data visualizer, somebody who is trained and skilled to present data in a way that um, companies and individuals can easily understand. And that is something that is going to happen within the next 10 to 15 years as well. And a lot of it is software related as well. If you look at all the list on the right hand side, they are software related and therefore having skills in software could be very, very marketable as well. Yeah. Uh, Professor Monica, do you have anything to say? Yeah, definitely. And I think it's not just about jobs that didn't exist or, or uh, actually exist over time. It's how jobs are actually changing, even though with the same job title these days. For example, uh, if you are a marketer these days, you need to pick up some uh, digital skills because there are so much social media marketing now and you will find that your job in some nature is changing if you are not uh, developing some digital literacy to even read some reports from um, online reports and you know what uh, people are actually saying online right, or on social media about your products, about your services. So this is really a very strong trend which we have observed in the past decade and it will continue into the future. Great, thank you. So we'll go on to the next slide, which talks a little bit about the uh, jobs that will get automated. So mainly the sectors, as you can see, accommodation, food services, those, uh, you know, they're the ones uh, that's predicted to be a, a massive whooping 73% is predicted to be automated. So what this sort of chart shows, it's from McKinsey, it's a report that they recently did. And what it shows is that these are the areas that you have to sort of start moving away from uh, if you want you know, a job that will sort of take you towards the future. And uh, so you can see stuff like management, you've got professionals, information technology, even administrative, um, they are the, at the lower end. So there will be some sort of automation, obviously, but um, there is just much less automation happening. But what it also shows is that you have to be digitally ready. Uh, like what you mentioned, Monica, which was about digital literacy skills as well, even as a business student, uh, just because you're not an IT student doesn't mean, you know, you don't, you need to forget about IT, you know, you, you still need those IT skills to really complement your uh, job or even to help you get that promotion. You know, even as a manager right now, you know, you may not need to know everything digital, but you do need to know what is out there so you can actually implement them to your That's team right. to, to um, make your, you know, job so much easier or, you know, so much better and just be up to date. Strata, the other thing that we should actually pay attention to, and I'm sure Professor Johnson and Professor Tony would agree, is mm -hmm. the underlying trend that data analytics and AI and uh, a number of other new innovation, new technology that's coming up that underpin all these different sectors. Not that that's right. we don't actually need people anymore in these, these sectors. sectors. Yeah. But it is that we have developed so much understanding through data analytics, for example, in accommodation, food services, 
that we can automate the process of selection of, um, of information uh, research, right? So that we actually reduce the cost of running businesses in this sector, but at the same time, it provides uh, much more accuracy in the information that we have access to and a much wider scope of you know, access to all different things. So it is that we need to be uh, paying attention to how all in these sectors or in the sectors that you are passionate about. You know, sometimes if I'm passionate about fashion, it doesn't matter that I'm, you know, I have a degree in finance, but I will go and find a job in a fashion industry. But how is my job as a financial analyst in the fashion industry going to change over time? Great. No, that's really enlightening stuff. Yes. We'll move on to the next one. It's uh, about the learning for the future. So what are the skills that you need in order to be competitive in the future so that, you know, you can actually uh, go out there and get into a career that you actually like, or, uh, or even, even if you change your jobs, how, how easily can you actually change your jobs because of the skills that you've, gained over the years so you have to start thinking about it now like will uh these four things that i've uh, that's mentioned on this slide here you can see it's actually uh skills that the world economic forum has actually recently just um told everyone that these are the skills that you need your students graduates everyone needs these skills so stuff like global citizen skills you know what is it it's it's about collaborating it's about teamwork um working and studying with people from different culture backgrounds you know globalization is inevitable so you got to prepare for it you know you and um you need to have also that global understanding you know it's not just local it's also global understanding because it's going to affect us you've got innovation and creativity skills and what is it to be innovative you know um and uh and and, and and also the jobs of the future, it's not even created yet. So most of the problems of the future is unseen. You know, you don't even know what the answer is. So you have to use your innovation and creative uh, thinking skills to really figure out the answers to so many problems uh, that the world is facing right now and will face uh, later on as well. So future workers need to be innovative and uh, creative and come up with all these new solutions. So this is something that, um, you know, our problem-based um, learning model at MIT also teaches our students, you know, this is uh, your degree has uh, all that embedded. So these are the, these are the skills that you learn. Um, and other than that, we've also got technology skills. So that one is, it's pretty obvious uh, as, you know, jobs will be more automated you, you know, future workers will probably need to even learn uh, basic programming. Like for me as a marketer, even I, I need to know, I need to have so much digital technology skills and I learn on the job and I learn on my free time as well. So on the job training and, you know, uh, is also so crucial as well. So um, the other one was the interpersonal skills. So that one is really, really important, especially, you know, in a day of, uh, social media as well. Um, whereas, you know, most of our students, uh, future students will probably be amazing in social media communicating. How good are you also communicating face to face or even uh, via zoom, you know, it, it is a form of face to face. So how good are you? Um, and um, stuff like skills of empathy, you know, how um, have you got emotional intelligence? being able to see the, from other people's perspective and, um, and, you know, future leaders need that, the, those skills to really succeed and uh, even to produce products, you know, you need uh, those interpersonal skills. So I'll let uh, the panelists talk a little bit about this um, stuff like learning for the future, you know, what does global citizen, you know, mean uh, in terms of our program, uh, Monica and Johnson and Tony, could you, Probably someone, uh, yeah, could mention something about that. I, I think the best opportunity that our students have is the mixture of um, students from everywhere in the world. Um, 
that mixture means that you have a foot in India, in Pakistan, in England, in Russia, in South Korea, any country that you have a student in your class or in your institution, you already have a network of people um, whom you could work with in future. And therefore that opportunity is often uh, hidden to many students. But if you expand your horizon and link up, know them, understand them, know their values, know their cultural background, what they like, what they don't like, what they would like to eat, what they would like to buy, what they would like, where they would like to go. You end up really, really now establishing yourself right from home at MIT as a global citizen. That's right, yes. I think um, what this slide also mentioned is how uh, being part of MIT, you know, uh, even being a student here where you get to work, you know, on group projects with students from all around the world, that will help you build uh, that interpersonal skills, that will help you become a global citizen. Um, our students, you can also be members of, you know, committees like Student Experience Committee, Teaching and Learning Committee, and that also teaches you, uh, you know, all these skills that really um, help you, you know, figure out creative learning skills, uh, innovation as well, even stuff like that. Yes. So, and Sarada, if I can add, sure. You know, at MIT, we have the Capstone Projects, right? Mm -hmm. It really builds this global citizenship among mm -hmm. our students because they, they have to be aware and be in touch with the communities around them as well as bringing their own background, bringing their own experience to share That's with right. a team of diverse uh, members because mm -hmm. everyone is unique and they are coming from you know, different places. And so this is actually building them to uh, have a good uh, understanding of developing sustainable approach to solving problems and it is not just a very limited perspective of uh, the issues that they have to handle. So being a global citizen is really preparing everyone to have a really good career in the future. Mm. Okay. So the next is, so um, a little bit about our support service and how it actually um, help students become global citizens, you know, helps uh, become, uh, help them sort of um, create that emotional intelligence. Um, and yeah, really, uh, what do you call that? Uh, <laughs> I just got a blank. Uh, really helps them answer those, um, those skills, you know, sort of get those skills that the World Economic Men uh, Forum mentioned earlier. So, our support services, we've got about four that I've uh, mentioned here. We've got the counseling, it's free and confidential, and you know, students get help with our, their personal and mental health issues. We've got peer mentoring. So students who, uh, who do excellent at a subject, they actually help another student out, which is another great way to, for, for really self-development as well. And we've got the center of learning, you know, uh, they'll help you produce outstanding assignments, you know, with your report writing skills and your essays. Uh, these are something that, you know, you actually have to take to your career as well. So bear in mind that, you know, even writing a good essay or report, this is something that you will need in your career, in your job, when you, once you graduate. So referencing skills and, and as we mentioned just now before, digital literacy skills as well. So these all sort of help you, you know, mold you to uh for the eventual eventual part which is having a career yeah and um, we, we actually do it quite well uh at mit we embed all of these um workshops and support services in our classroom that's right this means that students don't have to run around to different places and access this we actually as lecturer for example in my class this morning i invite a center of learning into my classroom and we did a writing workshop together. So that is really effective because, you know, we are also busy. If I'm going to ask you, Srada, tomorrow, can you go at another place to meet someone instead of bringing the person here immediately? It's really yeah. effective. No, that's amazing. That sounds good. And 
I believe oh, there's also the AIM module that students have to, first year students have to study. And mm -hmm. that covers, you know, all these things about assignments, report writing, referencing. Um, yeah, so that's really, really good. Um, the final one is about career development. So, you know, you, you get everything from coaching, one-on-one -on -one coaching to uh, the really uh, uh, minute stuff like the uh, CV, you know, getting your CV done, getting, you know, your job applications, uh, your interview skills, getting all of that sorted out so you can get a foot into even getting an interview. So we help you with that. Uh, we also teach you how to network and use social media. So stuff like uh, LinkedIn, you know, to really uh, open up your opportunities. And this actually reminds me of this student who um, I think two weeks into her coming into Australia, she was looking for a job and everyone had told her, oh no, you don't hardly have any experience. You're not gonna get much job at all. Uh, you know, you'll just, you know, go and do, you know, something like work at McDonald's or, you know, uh, or do Uber Eats or something like that. And she went to see Jared, our careers advisor, and he had told her something, you know, opposite, completely opposite stuff. And he really motivated her, spruced up her CV, you know, told her where to go, what to do, get her LinkedIn ID, you know, everything ready, set up. And you know what she did? She actually messaged the CEO of uh, a company, I'm not sure if I should mention it, Dun & Bradstreet. <laughs> it's a credit company, uh, one of the big, I think, big three companies, credit companies in Australia. And about 12 o'clock, I think, in the, at, in the morning, he messaged her back and said, you've got guts, you know, and I'll, gonna, I'll, I'll give you an interview at least. And I think a couple of days later, she went to the interview. She actually passed. She did so well. And she's got a job. And uh, this is two, three weeks coming, you know, just arriving in Australia. So, you know, amazing things like this, uh, you know, yeah. you, you just need someone to really help you. And we've got that, you know, we've got all the person, personnel, the staff, really, really qualified staff to really help you out. And, 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 and we are really serious about it because it's part of the assessment in a first year business communication unit. So you have to write a good CV and put right. up a LinkedIn profile. Yeah, wow, okay. I see, I didn't have that when I was, you know, in uni several years ago. That's amazing, you know, that would have, <laughs> that, that's amazing. So, and uh, the I'm, other thing as well is with career development, you, you know, besides getting expert advice, you get workshops and conferences, you know, career conferences where you actually get to meet with industry professionals and network with them. Uh, and you also have access to Career Hub, which is something that most of the universities have as well. So what it is, it's, it's a platform, it's like a job platform where you apply for internships and jobs. So you've got that access as a student, um, you know, uh, to jobs and internships in Australia, locally and all over the world. So this is something that, yeah, we provide to all our students as well. Uh, and, uh, sorry, uh, and one of the tying benefits in that is um, sorry, no, one go of on. the kind benefits in that is to look at four of them. Mm -hmm. Those are areas you build lifelong relationships with people. And if you are mentoring somebody now, that person won't forget you for the rest of his or her career. Mm -hmm. The same thing with career development. The same thing with people that see you in the center of learning. They know you. You can reference them in future. They will reference you as well. So these are really, really strong links you start to build from your degree up, even before you start to work in your career. And they'll be there for you in future as well. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Tony, do you have anything to say, add, to add to this or are we good? <laughs> uh, we are okay, but uh, I would like to point out that for the Capstone project, uh, we do actually send out the students to get the Capstone project themselves uh, through the help of a career development team. And uh, they are learning so much, including um, writing, writing a proposal and cold calling the CEOs. Uh, I think they're learning a lot. So it's going wow. to be very exciting. Yeah. yeah, cold calling, how nerve wracking, but such, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a personal development, de development, isn't it? It's amazing. 
Uh, okay, so we'll go on to the next one for learning for the future. We'll continue in that. Innovating and creating. So stuff like uh, problem-based learning, capstone projects that you guys mentioned before. If you can talk a little bit about that. So how does um, each school incorporate these in, in their degree, in their course? So if I may continue um, discussing is that when you go out to the industry and uh, when you work in a company and when you're given a particular problem to solve, um, in many occasions, uh, there is no set solution. There is no set one solution. And there can be potentially many solutions and all of their benefits and all of their merits are depending on uh, rather a, a, a number of uh, uh, parameters that uh, sometimes you're in good control, sometimes you're not in good control. So we can always say uh, industry problems will have a uh, complexity in it um, because there's no set solution. So what we would like to do through our, our capstone projects and uh, later year study is that we are presenting you the problems during our assignment as well as during our uh, class times. We present the problem so that you, you practice um, analyzing the problem and trying to come across uh, a potential uh, solutions. And then you analyze the, these set of potential solutions and uh, uh, you make a recommendation uh, based on your, uh, uh, your, your analysis and uh, your recommendation should come with the rationale. I think this is an excellent training uh, for the students to do, uh, uh, improve their career opportunities once they graduate. Um, and all those key terms such as uh, problem-based learning, critical thinking, analytical learning, and all that comes to uh, the, the point that we are trying to train the students to be able to think on their own and come to a critical uh, uh, solution and uh, make uh, uh, proper professional recommendations. Um, I think that's an excellent skills to have uh, in a, a rather volatile uh, environment to be able to analyze things critically and recommend properly. Yeah, in the School of Business, uh, we actually have a compulsory unit called Critical Thinking and Decision Making, which is really rare. I don't see this uh, as a common unit, but it is such an important unit because, you know, developing critical thinking skills, which you can apply to making a lot of other decisions, is really important. And in Capstone Project and other business projects that we run, we actually use a lot of case studies so that students uh, will learn the specialist knowledge and be able to apply to different scenarios. And the for the, for the project that they are doing, they have to analyze information from the real world. We have no textbook for them. We have no template for them. They just have to go out there and search, do their own independent research, do their own independent thinking, make up their own uh, independent assumptions, test the assumptions. So all these steps is what they have to develop through the three years of uh, study that they are going to do at the School of Business. That's great. Johnson, do you have anything to say or should we move on? A little bit because um, the, the world is becoming more and more complex and they also expect us to think in that direction. So all the simple thinkings in the past have been done. What is re remaining for us in our 20th century and 21st century, 21st century is to analyze problems and solve them. Think of SpaceX yesterday docking with the ISIS that requires a lot of critical thinking and an uh, uh, and analytical learning. Somebody sits down to go through it, where can I make mistakes? Where is mistake coming from? And they allow the person to make mistakes. And once the mistakes are all corrected, the system works. And the, the lesson there is don't give up if you are making mistakes as you learn.
Great, thank you. Um, so we'll go on to the next bit, which talks a little bit more about the industry-based projects and how that all ties together as well. So we've uh, written down some uh, projects, some that uh, the students, our students have done so far and what you sort of can expect as a student at MIT to do as well. So they're all really, really high tech stuff. You know, we've got uh, machine learning, developing an app to help farmers, uh, retirement homes. So that's on the rise as well. So and even helping the medical sector with using AI recognition of patient systems, um, cybersecurity and even um, stuff for the environment. So helping out an environmental company. Um, yeah. So have you, could the panelists sort of mention anything uh, of importance that you can tie in with this, how industry-based projects really helps students develop those global skills? Oh, I'll, I'll start briefly. Mm -hmm. um, um, as we discussed throughout the whole presentation was that uh, we are going through industry uh, 4.0 era. So yeah. in the industry 4.0 era is defined as the full automation of industry uh, by use of artificial intelligence and data science. And one thing about automation is that once some things are automated, we really never go back. That's the thing. Uh, I, I, mm -hmm. I cannot remember the time. And by the way, I'm in Sydney. Uh, I cannot go back to the time where I have to throw $2 coins to cross the Sydney Harbor Bridge. Now uh -huh. I just have an e-tag. I will never be able to go back to the time I will queue, I'll be queuing up with the cars to throw $2 coins so the bridge gate will open. It's not possible. So I think we, it will continue on. This automation will continue on and on. And I think one of the things we need to really uh, grasp is that we really need to have a good understanding of this new technology such as AI and data science and so on. So, so most of the capstone projects are trying to introduce the students to those automations. Um, if you look at the, uh, the, the part where the Shrada mentioned, the artificial intelligence based medical support for the doctors. Oh yes, of course the doctors can make, uh, 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 you know, make a judgment in terms of this, uh, looking at the patient's symptoms and so on, but, but then computers can be used to process a lot of uh, information from the patients uh, and uh, automate part of the decision making for the doctors so that uh, the doctors can uh, be more efficient and effective and uh, uh, it will be less error uh, prone. Uh, yeah. So uh, even, even last yesterday, I took my uh, pregnant wife to see a GP and uh, we, when she was trying to find a, a prescri prescribed medication for my wife, all she has to do was search the keyword on her computer and uh, some of the names of the prescri prescription drugs came along and uh, she could, of course, uh, the GPs have to have their own knowledge, but I think the whole these automations are very exciting and uh, we're trying to introduce the students into the concept of AI and automations as much as I can, we can through this capstone project. I, I am very sure Monica and Johnson has plenty more to add to this. And I think um, taking out from where uh, Professor John stopped, one of the things identified by the current pandemic is um, the importance of um, health, sanitation, and also how to get uh, the right medication at the right time for the right person. And you will find that um, all of the projects listed in this slide relates to them. Uh, if you are quarantined in a hotel in Melbourne and you are alone in that room, no one wants to come inside your room with food. They would rather drop your food or carry, ask a robot to bring it to you. Um, 
automation are uh, things that some of these projects are also looking at. Or if you are now going to produce enough food for us in Australia to eat during pandemic or outside it, you, you look at the farms today, they never be the same anymore. Um, where you plant, what you plant, what fertilizer you use, whether you use fertilizer or not, um, are all embedded in the projects we give to you at MIT. So that as an engineer, you can work in the farm and nobody, they will recruit you and big farms will recruit you as well. Or uh, if you are in the hospital, you'll still be relevant in the hospital to look after data analytics for medicines and what medicine to give, like in Tony's wife's case, and where to find it, when to find it. All of that is what the world is going through at the moment will be very, very relevant in the near future as, as well. Yes, wow. and, you know, the School of Business supports these guys in IT, in engineering. Uh, <laughs> we love their projects, the AI projects, you know, and all this technology, new innovation. But at the end of the day, you've got to find someone to invest money in developing <laughs> all this new innovation. And that's why we are so important in the School of Business, uh, as important as the IT specialists and the engineers and the AI specialists. Because, like for example, we have uh, developed a HR workforce planning and system for a company that uh, provide uh, straws that is made of uh, bamboos. This is a new environmentally friendly innovation and we have actually helped uh, develop a marketing strategy for a dry sanitation project which is uh, available for those you know countries or, or emerging economies where they couldn't actually find proper um, sanitation uh, for their citizens. So this is where School of Business come in to help develop all the business strategy, marketing strategy, investment, financial analysis to be able and enable all this new innovation to move on. Wow. No, that's, that's amazing. You know, the takeaway I got from all this is if you study a business or IT degree here at MIT, you can go on to do all these important jobs. <laughs> and truly, you know, it, it's just uh, the areas that it covers, the AI stuff that you learn, the networking, the cybersecurity, it, it covers such an amazing different industries, you know, whether it's health, environment, um, you know, it's whether it's food as well, uh, it, it will probably even helps food scarcity as well for farmers. So. And with the medical one that you were talking about in recognition of patient symptoms, you, you know, you could use that even on little kids who probably don't even know how to talk and say, you know, what symptoms they're having, you know, what they're suffering. Uh, you know, that could probably help little kids um, and help di doctors diagnose them faster uh, or even animals as well, because I've got a cat myself. And, you know, if, if it gets ill, it wouldn't really, it wouldn't really know what to say to me, you know, yeah, so it's amazing, um, you know, what it could do. And I'm just actually, I'm just flabbergasted by, yeah, the areas that, yeah, it could help. So learning for the future, um, technology. Now, I, I know you've already mentioned a little bit uh, about this, Monica, but what technical skills do business students need? Um, you know, that will, technological skills do they need? For um, learning? It's really broad because it depends on what business special, uh, specialization you have. For example, in accounting, you will have to nowadays know how to uh, be able to perform uh, accounting analytics uh, because there are a lot of data driven decision making to do these days. If you are marketing, you will have to perhaps learn about social media marketing. Uh, search engine, um, you will have to be able to perform marketing analytics as well. And if you are in finance, if you are in um, uh, management, you would just look at LinkedIn, right? It has automated the search for talents. 
um, is improving over time and the recommendations that you get from the system and you get from you know the network of people that is drawing on that one platform itself is extensive so these are the skills that is not just related to what uh, your business field is but you you can develop and enhance your digital literacy you can also work in a diverse team with the IT specialist, for example, with an engineer, with an AI uh, scientist, so that you can be a good project manager that lead uh, the developments of all these exciting innovations. So from time to time, you will have to upgrade your digital skills. Yeah, no, that's good. And and to help you help you do that as well, I believe our business school, uh, you can actually take electives from IT. At, at, you know, business students can actually study some IT units uh, in their electives, and I believe IT students can also study business units as well. Um, I, if they can they do want, more than that. Yeah, they go can, on. <laughs> they can do more than that. Um, in addition, they we sh we now move into when we share projects. So the IT students will do the IT side of the project wow. and the business school will do the business side of the project. So mm -hmm. it's a win-win for the two groups of students and for the two schools as well. Um, we may know the IT more, but they know business side more than we do. And the school, two schools are now working together as well to make sure that um, you can have a project that is shared by two schools. That's right. We have two examples this trimester that we have a smart uh, helmet uh, project that has been developed by the School of IT and Engineering at MIT. And this trimester, the School of Business students are developing a commercialization strategy for the smart helmet. And another project is for a smart recycle bin. So we're actually working together. It's almost like a little business, little company that we have formed around all these projects that we have. Wow. Yeah. That's, um, that sounds amazing. I think the right combination of an IT skill and right combined business skill probably will attract highest uh, salaries in these days. Um, I, I think Monica is running a hub on combining business and IT programs. I remember that as a bite. Uh, I think uh, if the students have good understanding of an IT, combined with a great understanding of business, they really are a great candidate to attract very high salary. I, I can actually mention a little bit more on that because I have many students who have graduated uh, uh, through my past 25 years of teaching and I have to, I mean, amongst the ones that I know, the, the person who is making the highest salary right now is actually working as a sales engineer. Um, sales engineer being that you have the technological skills and you will market the new IT products to the another business and so on. So I think they are like, she's making uh, more than uh, 250k if I remember correctly. Wow. I just wanted to share that just yeah. to motivate our students. <laughs> no, that's that's great and that's what they come here for, you know, to really broaden their horizons about what kind of jobs they could get, you know. They look at their skills that they currently have or that they want to develop and uh, think about what career they want at the end of it uh, or what career they can aim for, you know, by developing their skills here. So it's amazing. Thank you so much for that uh, advice about that, you know, your, your story. Uh, do we have any other inputs before we head to the next slide? No? Okay, great. We'll just go to the next one. Oh, actually, I think that was just gone back. Ah, interpersonal skills. Something that, you know, um, is so important, but it gets overlooked often enough. Uh, can we uh, speak a little bit about it? Uh, essentially, uh, focusing on a, a lot about how, you know, our project units, um, uh, how it actually helps and why, why did we even introduce project units? Was it mainly to answer these in, interpersonal skills that, you know, students lack most of the time? Could you uh, speak a little bit more about it? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. 
Professor Johnson. I, I, I think, thank you. One of the things we do, uh, one of the reasons for introducing projects is these three real ideas. One, uh, we group students together so that they can relate, not only on the technology level, but also one-on-one, -on -one, personally. Um, the, the second reason is to, in that group, there's going to be major leader. And the other group members will learn to lead as well. Because if you have a good leader, you are, and you are working under that good leader, you are most likely going to learn how to be a good leader as well. And therefore, they actually participate and learn. The other third reason for putting students in a group, you share skills. No one on earth has all the skills for making anything. One person might be good in writing, you are good in connecting components. The other person is just good in presenting your ideas to the market. And um, within that group, all those skills are brought together. And if they work together, then you are going to come out with a very, very successful project. And indeed, you see also that within the group, there is somebody that could be doing so well. The other person is not doing so well. And you need to help. And you need to understand that um, all the fingers in my hand are not equal. And therefore, sometimes you have to have empathy for your group members and chip in and get the work done. And then the group benefits as a whole. Morning. Um, yeah, I totally agree with what Professor Johnson has just said. And to put it bluntly, I have observed that one the groups that lack interpersonal skills are the groups that are actually are not performing so well. So it is a really, really important attribute that we all need. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when I was a student many hundred years ago, um, I didn't like, personally, I didn't like the group project so much. Um, I was that uh, smart Asian guy who wanted to do everything by himself and I felt it was a bit quicker and then I graduated I went to uh, as many of my colleagues knows I went to work as in Australian defense and uh, most of the project that I have received in the major company is not possible for one person to do Basically, student assignment, yes, you can do, or I can do my, myself, once you go out to the major company and corporations, the project you will be sitting on is practically impossible for a single person to do. Sometimes you have to work with many tens of people, many even sometimes hundreds of people, I mean, many times usually tens of people, and sometimes it's across the cities and across the countries and across the oceans. And, and then I realized there's a great skills that I need to have that including the working with other people across the, um, uh, the, the physical distance as well as having the leadership and empathy to understand the other people. I think it also relate to the global citizenship we discussed before as well, because I think the earth is becoming too small um, with the internet, social media, and all this communication tools, including the Zoom. Um, mm. the, I think Earth is becoming very small and we got to have a good empathy and good understanding of other people to make, make your project a success. Um, otherwise, it's not possible <laughs> to, to be done. Yeah. Uh, that's just sharing my part, yeah. That's right. When I was at Deloitte and I have to always uh, form the teams for every single new project that comes out, I have to go to the resource manager, grab whoever I can work with and I know they work well in the team. Those people are usually not available. Why? Because everyone knows that they are good team players and they are the hot assets in the company. Everyone wants to grab those people and then 
whoever that's left behind in the register, we beg the resource manager to just, uh, can you just replace this guy with another person? I really want to work with the other person. So <laughs> this is one of the good attributes that is so easily observed at workplaces that we all need to have. That's right. No, it's, it's funny that you mentioned this because, uh, because this, this sort of happens obviously when, when, while you're doing the group work uh, or any project. So what kind of advice do you have for students who are having to do group works? You know, how do you get that, <laughs> make sure that it turns out amazing? <laughs> you just have to have an open mind, I think. Mm -hmm. be empath be, 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 have empathy towards others and learn from each other. Yeah. Um, Tony and Johnson? I, I suppose um, we... Oh. Oh, you go, Tony. Okay, no, I'll, I'll be very quick. Uh, I think within the group, as a leader, I think there is a room for young students to learn how to encourage and motivate other members um, so that they can excel uh, and perform better than what's expected. There are many times that we can improve them and uh, make it work as a group. Of course, it's challenging, but there's always a room to improve for everyone. Sorry, mm -hmm. Johnson. Yeah. I, I wanted to say that one of the things um, I learned in working in a group is that um, the failure of a group is my failure. And the success of that group is my success. And usually that is what I look for in, in the group because um, I know that if we don't work well, we're all going to fail. You can't go out and say, I, you failed. It is the group that failed. And I think uh, it is something we want students to learn early so that when they go into industry, they emerge as group players and also can stand on their own when they say need to stand on their own. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really good point, actually. Yeah, it's something that you need to start you know, building so that once you get into industry, you're actually prepared. And you know all the things that you need to do to get a really good group together and make your actual project a success. So really, really good advice. Thank you very much. We will go on to the next segment of the uh, presentation today, the webinar, which is about online learning at MIT and how, you know, how that's working out and what we do, what can you expect as students uh, of studying online for this July intake. So I'll um, probably have a Monica who can start with, yeah, start off. Yep, so we have run a virtual classroom starting from this trimester, it has been a success. We have been to many uh, webinars uh, uh, by organized by TEXA and we have compared notes with other universities and institutions we are actually doing very well and we have also gathered our student feedback about how we are doing they're really enjoying it and they feel that they are fully supported in their learning and it's easy to navigate the learning management systems contains all the information and what they they need to find is all there so our virtual classrooms uh, that's not just take the form of, you know, let's log on and, you know, talk about the things for three hours. But we have organized many activities, forums, chat rooms, um, recordings as well that students can access to and encourage to uh, uh, conduct during the workshop. So we are running it not just yeah, like a dry three hour lecture that, you know, a lot of people would just fall asleep and then they will just look at uh, very boring PowerPoint slides. It's not like that at all. So we try to engage our students through many different formats and forms of uh, interactions. And we also provide uh, ongoing consultation uh, for students who actually need help in incorporating the help from center of learning and counselors and mentors so if you study at mit you will feel like you have, you are living with a community a close community who is always there for each other you know 
and we have course coordinators and we have the head of school. They will actually call you. I mean, anywhere that I have studied before, I have studied in the US before, in Canada, and now in Australia, I have never received any call from my teacher. <laughs> But this is so special at MIT, you know, you don't just see them online, but you also hear from them. They will call you and say, how are you going? You know, I don't see you in class. Is something up? You know, do you need support? Do you want me to call the counselor for you? So it is really that very warm and supportive um, feeling that you have studying at MIT. I think that is really special. So. When you see online learning, a lot of students will think, oh, oh, okay, so this is really, you know, a lot of things will be disconnected. I will just be like here and no one will care about me. Completely different. It is really uh, beyond anyone's expectation that MIT is really doing very well in supporting our students learning online. No matter where you are, we have students back in India, back in Nepal, and they are still connected with us. I still see my students for projects and I say, wow, you're wearing t-shirts, look at me, I'm wearing turtleneck and everything. So it is such a, a good feeling to be connected that way. Yeah, so yeah, back to you, Sraya. That, yeah, no, that sounds amazing. It's um, because one of the things that, because you talked about connection and one of the things I wanted to mention was the fact that uh, a lot of students do think that it's very isolating and it can be, I won't, you know, sugarcoat it, but we do, we are, we are, we are listening to all the feedback from students as we go. We have weekly catch up sessions with them, find out what they want, you know, what needs improving or any activities they want added. So even our student events have mostly gone online, you know, they've all gone li online and uh, we've tried to make it as interactive as possible. So, you know, we even had a photography competition as well. And we had some amazing photographs sent in by students. Um, and we also had some, you know, skills, talents, you know, and found out that we actually have quite a lot of artists uh, within MIT. So it's, it's really amazing, you know. We, we've, we've tried to keep the discussion continuing even after classes. Uh, so, you know, your virtual classrooms as well, they are recorded. So mm -hmm. even if you say miss part of your classes or uh, you need to sort of study again, you know, you're doing a revision period, you can just jump online and then rewatch the class again. And maybe there's some things that you've missed and you can catch up again and really helps, you know, adds to another resource that you can use in order to really study well, you know, um, and understand your subject really, really well and prepare you for that exam uh, at the end of it. Um, so all the other stuff like study materials, they're all online. And, you know, if you need help, you book one-on-one -on -one appointments with your lecturers, your tutors, with staff from Center of Learning, from uh, if you need help as well with counselors, you've got all that, you know, over the phone, over email, uh, over a virtual uh, like over zoom and skype as well so it's really really amazing and no it's it's really great to hear that our students are you know enjoying it they're doing so well as well so the next section talks a little bit about what you've already mentioned um uh it's it's about the student support you mentioned and i mentioned as well um and how our library is also you know students can actually access the library 24 7 so to do their assignments to get those journal articles You've got all that online. And I can tell you, the library team is very, very responsive. We've got Luke there, and he is excellent. So if you need any help at all in the library, just shoot them an email, uh, or you can set up an appointment with Luke as well, and he will help you sort you know, through all that stuff that you don't understand. And the other thing is, we won't just throw you in the deep end. So Moodle is where most of your stuff are, and you will, there are lots of, um, Sort of FAQs, frequently asked questions and things that you can refer to when you first start off to really understand how Moodle works, you know, how the library works and how AMS works. So you've all got all that access. And if you, if you, if you still need help, then you've got us virtually. You can, you can contact us. Uh, and even Career Services has gone online as well. Uh, um, so yeah, Career Hub has always been online. So now, um, 
all the workshops that used to be in person has now gone online. So Jared, our careers advisor, does a fantastic job with that. And another thing I wanted to mention as well was how, you know, um, communicating by Zoom, even being able to use Zoom, it's amazing. It's, 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 it's almost like a skill set, I would say, that you have to learn because eventually once you go into a job, you know, it could be, you, you could be working remotely or, um, yeah, you could be working remotely for a certain period of time or for your full job, or you may need to stay at home one day and, you know, access uh, and work from home for some reason or the other. And this is also sort of preparing you for that, you know, and that's what maybe students don't know yet but they will later on once they get into the workforce. So it is something, you know, it's actually preparing you uh, for your next career. So that's something I thought, you know, was exciting as well about online study. Now, I wanted to speak a little bit about the internship and work in direct learning. How has that changed? How is that being implemented? Because obviously these are very practical units hands-on practical units how are the both the schools the school of it and engineering and business can i get um something from johnson first so um yeah from the school of it and engineering the capstone projects are derived from companies in industry um, they give us topics that are relevant to their business um, topics they themselves would work on if they had space and time to do so. But they know students can handle them and they can supervise students with us. So they give those projects and our students are paired with those projects and staff in the school. And I said before, this is one foot in the door because our students have that opportunity to work with a CEO, with an MD, or with a manager. And if they prove themselves, they can put a second foot in the door and they get a job. Now, our role in the school is to supervise half of part of it and the company supervises part of it. And it is in all our courses. For the internship, it is similar. Our students are picked by companies and they are given projects that they are actually running they're actually delivering NBN or planting 5G base stations or measuring the 5G signals in the city. That is a practical situation. And companies take the students to do exactly that with engineers as well. And those are the ways to get students to get jobs very early, even before they graduate. They're already employed. And I'm sure the School of Business and the networking partner here, Dr. Tony Jan, also had a lot more to say in terms of um, these programs in, the, in their various courses and school. Tony? Uh, as for networking, it's very similar to the, what Professor Johnson have addressed. Um, I think the key word for Australia this day is the job readiness. That is, once the uh, students graduate from their program, how ready they are uh, to be useful in the workplace or workforce uh, immediately. And uh, that has been the question for some time because uh, many of the past education system uh, focused a lot more on theories, less uh, on practicality, and also the, uh, the skills that may be uh, required uh, to be part of the workforce immediately. And only recently, uh, many of the Australian institutes took an interest in the bringing up their courses to be more practical and more industry oriented so the students will have more exposure to the industry. And as part of this is uh, work integrated learnings. There are several phases to this. Um, some of the things included the assignments being uh, completely case-based uh, studies and the capstone project, as uh, Professor Johnson mentioned, uh, is borrowing from, I mean, the, the idea and support is coming from the industry themselves, so they will have that exposure to the industry. And then some of them actually uh, cleverly uh, utilize that opportunity to actually get the win the internships and so on. So we are very actively, actively working on improving these opportunities. Uh, 
And uh, I think this is where the future is. Uh, I think the online education and work integrated learning is uh, where the future uh, uh, lies. I think we are looking at what uh, the future of education would be like. And I think we are traveling well and we are on the right track um, to, to, to satisfy the industry requirement. That's my part, Monica. Sure. And uh, Monica, how has uh, business school actually implemented online uh, internships or work integrated learning projects and stuff? So in um, the School of Business, we have, because of COVID-19, all our clients for the project actually requested that we only have Zoom meeting or Skype meeting and collaborative uh, tools such as Google Doc and Google Slides and, you know, um, Trello so that they can actually uh, catch up with the project as it goes along. And um, our students are actually, one thing that I, I'm really happy to see in the Capstone project is the student develop so much passion and drive themselves that they want to achieve success. And that's really, really uh, important for their self-professional development because you can throw a textbook at them and they will read it and they will sit for an exam. But this is real world examples. There is real problem that they're trying to solve. And there is a real business that they are consulting with. And throughout that experience, they develop the communication skill and they develop, they sharpen actually, their, their problem solving skills and the critical thinking skills because without this real challenge, and in the beginning, it was so difficult, they came to me they will say, I don't have this information. I don't know about that. But over time, they stop saying things like that. They will come to me and say, we found this. And we think we can do this. What do you think? So it is really such a great journey for them. And towards the end of their study, right before they're going out to get a real job, they are developing their drive, their passion, their independent learning skills, and the critical thinking skills. It is such a blessing to see that our graduates from MIT is able to achieve that. Wow, the, you know, uh, what you mentioned about how the students are now taking initiative, uh, before that, you know, they were just a little bit scared, you know, to really push themselves and they think, you know, uh, I don't have the answer, but at the end of it, they think, I don't have the answer yet, but I'll go and find it. And, you know, those are the sort of attitude, the skills that I find uh, is really, really valued in the workforce. I can mm. tell you now as well, uh, you know, my managers are the same, you know, they want someone, a graduate, when they come into work, they give you a problem and you figure out the issue, you know, you, yes, you can get some help as well, but you need to have that can do attitude, you know, that, that attitude that says, okay, I don't actually know the problem. I mean, the answers to that problem, but I'll find out, you know, <laughs> I'll use my resources to find out. And it's essentially teaching students to be resourceful and which is amazing. Yeah, yeah because Education 4.0 as proposed by, um, you know, uh, many, many different uh, think tank around the world now is that students need to embrace this collaborative based learning, right? They need to teach each other things, just like what Johnson has mentioned just now. You need to learn from each other. That is how you develop in your own career in the future. Yeah, that's great. Do we have any other uh, additions to, would you like to add anything more to the points that we've already discussed today? No? Okay, we'll move on to the next segment, which is about micro-credential, and then we'll circle back uh, to sort of talk a little bit about, you know, whatever we've talked about today. So micro-credential, I will pass the mantle on to uh, Monica, who will talk a little bit about this. Yes, so um, you will actually uh, begin to see more and more the word bite, as Tony has mentioned before at MIT, because this word is actually very special to MIT. We have a hub which BITE stands for Business Innovation Technology and Entrepreneurship. 
what it is is embrace this new digital era and, and, and provide a space for our students to come in, develop their own ideas and become innovative. But of course, they need support in their uh, journey to develop all these skills. And that's why we are going to develop more and more micro-credential uh, initiative with um, uh, IT engineering. So all, all the schools at MIT have identified areas where we can support our students with bite-sized learning. That means this could be embedded in the formal units that they are undertaking. And it could also become extracurricular activities outside of the classroom, which if they complete, they can earn a badge. It can be recognized on the academic transcript. And it could be also enhancing some skills that can help them achieve success in their formal study. So that is why we introduce micro-credentials to help them develop um, knowledge that they may need a little bit more push towards and it help them to develop specialist uh, knowledge that they may not uh, get it in their formal study because it doesn't belong to the uh, formal study plan that they have, but they want to add on to what they can uh, access to. Maybe it's because it is relevant to the project that they are doing or it's relevant to a particular unit that they want to. Have. So the micro-credentials include uh, innovation, it include uh, design thinking, for example, it include leadership. So all these are very specific developments that we're going to help our students with. And they can develop this by choosing, depending again on their passion, rather, because passion drives success, right? Yes, So definitely. they can actually choose what they want to develop themselves to be in order to be prepared. Uh, to be prepared for their future career. Yeah, no, that's amazing. And uh, I wanted to circle back to the point where you said about the Byte uh, business inf innovation technology and entrepreneurship. Was that the right one? Yeah. 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 So something to watch out for because I'm pretty sure uh, some students out there, they will be saying, oh, I don't really want to, uh, you know, climb the corporate ladder. I actually want to create my own business, uh, you know, and Yes, you get that degree and you will learn all the skills that you need. Uh, and with the Byte program, you also learn the entrepreneurship. So even if it's an IT, a tech company that you want, you know, it could be the next Facebook, Twitter, uh, yeah. whatever. Um, yeah, so it, it's, it's amazing. It's something to watch out for, definitely. Right. And in I, micro, I, my, Sorry, go on. You say that's right. Uh, in my MPA, Master of uh, Professional Accounting Unit, um, I ran a survey with my students. 50% of them told me that they want to become an entrepreneur. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. That's the future. Yes, that is. It is. You know, um, yeah, so I'm pretty sure a lot of the listeners here are also probably 50% of them want to be an entrepreneur. And, you know, you, ha you do have that option as well, you know, getting a degree. Yeah. And you never know the route to being an entrepreneur could be your project, your custom project. That's right. At MIT. And, and even the friends that you meet at MIT, you know, um, you, you can, yeah, group together and, you know, hatch a Shoda, really amazing idea. <laughs> yeah. Shoda, may I add to what Monica and Johnson mentioned just Yeah, now? definitely. Go ahead. So that the Google, in, in fact, was the capstone project for two master students. So oh. Google, the whole idea of the Google search engine was actually a capstone project wow. uh, for a postgraduate student though. Uh, so you might want to search that on the Google. Yeah, they, they how they actually even things. came up with that idea. Yeah, uh, it was their capstone project to develop a search engine based on some heuristic machine learning mm -hmm. and they did it well. And their professor invited investors to come in and investors actually put in millions of dollars to make it actually work. And where, that's where they are now as wow. a, as a billionaire situation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, well, you can search for that, yeah. There's another word that besides entrepreneur, these days we have intrapreneur. 
who are okay. entrepreneurs within companies, you know? Like we are all working for companies, but we can still be entrepreneurs in the area of specialty that we are working in. Because oh. we need to keep innovating. Mm. No, that's food for thought. Yeah, that's great. So I think uh, we'll, if, if anyone, if no one else has got anything else to add, then um, we'll move on to the last bit, which is just sort of wrapping up. Um, it's, it's about, it's talking about how MIT's degrees, you know, it's more than just a degree. And um, in fact, in our MIT graduate attributes, you know, you've got stuff like analytical and problem solving, communication, ethics, independent and lifelong learning, all those things, attributes of what uh, our degree is sort of created in such a way that it um, uh, uh, sort of creates, sort of gives students the, these attributes by the time they graduate. So that's what our degrees aim to do besides giving you the technical skills. Um, and what, what it turns out is the World Economic Forum, they recently um, put a study out and they figured out that the skills that students are required for tomorrow, you know, the skills that they need to cultivate right now are very, very similar to whatever, you know, MIT values here, our MIT graduates actually need. So stuff like innovation and creativity skills. So that was, that's like problem solving, analytical, technology skills, uh, interpersonal skills, with communication, uh, you've got personalized and self-paced learning, accessible and inclusive learning. So that sort of covers independent and lifelong learning as well. And, and then they've also got problem-based and collaborative learning. Yeah, so these are some of the, you know, traits that they're looking for. And so did, um, did, does anyone have anything to add to that? Um, if I may start, Mm -hmm. um, this MIT graduate attributes um, for us is not just a keyword, mm -hmm. uh, but then um, uh, through the course design and assessment design, all of them are actually being mapped mm -hmm. to our learning. And uh, if you look at uh, um, some of our, some of the audience are our students. If you look at the unit descriptions they are actually mapped. Mm -hmm. Each of the learning outcome, learning items are mapped to these graduate, graduate attributes so that we actually uh, leave these uh, attributes rather than just having them as the keyword. We actually uh, are making a great use of it and linking all our activities to this. Um, so really uh, our graduate um, should really uh, uh, encompass all those attributes in uh, through their learning. Yes, in, in addition to their hard skills, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. So we're nearly at the end of our session. Um, the next few ones will basically be me talking a little bit about uh, you know how to apply at MIT and about the scholarships, and then we'll head on to the Q and A session. So if you've got any questions at all, um, I'll ask the viewers, the listeners to sort of send in your questions now. I can see a couple at the moment, but we'll go on. Um, so for those who didn't attend our first two sessions in uh, for IT and business, I just wanted to quickly mention that we've got scholarships available uh, for both our domestic and student international students. So get in touch with us to find out more about them. Um, you know, how much scholarships you can get and how do you get them. Um, to apply, you know, most students, uh, so domestic students have, can apply through VTEC or they can apply directly uh, and onshore international students can apply online or via agents and offshore students have to, must apply through an agent in their country. So we'll now head on to the uh, question and answer session. Thank you so much for attending our webinar to all the viewers and listeners. And thank you also to our academic uh, staff. You guys were great. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks for coming. Bye.